Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Mango. I'm a business development director here at Omega Performance, and welcome to webinar number two in our credit fundamental series. And this webinar number two is going to focus on the credit decision strategy and ultimately back to the basics. And uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, a colleague on the phone, uh, Laura Bieber, who's not only one of our subject matter experts with Omega Performance, uh, but also one of our instructors and one of our consultants. So we rely heavily on Laura for not only industry knowledge and experience, but also uh, the delivery that many of you uh, may have experienced in the classroom. So with that said, uh, I'll pass it over to Laura to briefly introduce yourself, and then, uh, and then we'll get started. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. Um, I actually spent about 25 years with Bank of America, uh, or actually predecessor banks, both on the client-facing side as well as in credit roles, including a couple years in special assets, and that really helped uh, improve my ability to not only understand credit and the numbers, but really how business strategies and management in particular can lead a company in the wrong direction. And on the client-facing side, I worked on both ends of the spectrum, you know, with in large corporate banking as well as middle market and, and business banking, um, where I did more Main Street lending. And for the past, past 14 years or so, I've been on the learning and development side, um, both for B of A and M&T Bank, and now I'm a full-time consultant. So well, I'm glad to be here today. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Laura, and again, we appreciate your time for being here. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is our, our second uh, rendition here in the Credit Fundamental Series. The first one we had uh, just about a month ago, and we focused on credit culture with uh, our good friend Tom Early from Citizens Bank, uh, discussing leadership and how it plays into uh, developing a credit culture within a bank and ultimately the delivery. And uh, just to go over some of the details that we're going to cover in today's session, some of the outcomes, some of the learning outcomes. We're going to fundamentally define what the credit decision strategy is, how it effectively enhances the loan approval process, overall how it enriches lenders' understanding of a business from a broad perspective, and ultimately expanding that bank relationship, improvement of the loan repayment analysis of a business, and ultimately framing the processes and procedures that are really critical to a strong sales and credit culture from a policy and a procedural standpoint. So why don't we go ahead and, and get started with this. And, and I alluded to before, Laura, the credit decision strategy. So let's take a couple minutes. Let's discuss it overall from a framework standpoint, and then we'll get into the details. Is that a good starting place? Sure. So really, the credit decision strategy is, and you can see on the screen, it's really a systematic or approach or really a blueprint to um, how really successful bankers, both on the client-facing side initially and then the credit side, can really be ensured that you are capturing all the necessary information that you need in order to proceed with the decision. And that includes both the risk side, the opportunity side as well. And as the information is gathered, and this is somewhat of a sequential approach here, we can make we can draw conclusions as to the strengths and weaknesses of the borrower as well as the actual deal itself. And, and it's ideally sort of arranged so that the decision must meet certain hurdles for ultimately a loan approval to take place, the client to approve the deal, and the loan get booked. So, um, of course, it ends with the final step down there at the bottom in red, which is that continuous monitoring of the relationship to identify any risk or changes, but also for further cross-sell. Um, I really do think that this framework can apply to any business of any size, any loan of any size, it's it's pretty agile, it's pretty universal, and really as a best practice, I think that um, it's important that we have collaborative and timely conversations between the credit side and the sales side as early on in the process as possible. And this framework has been around for over 40 years. I remember taking a mega training back when I started in the early 80s, and it's still true today. I mean, there might be some underlying formulas that are a little different or approaches that have been augmented, but when you think about the actual framework, it's back to basics. Credit is credit, and it really hasn't changed much at all. Well, it's a really interesting point that you mentioned, Laura, especially 
kind of the 40 years. Obviously, there's been a lot of a lot of credit cycles, a lot of business cycles throughout that 40 year process, and especially when I'm meeting with a lot of our our clients, especially the folks that have been around for a while, they always reference you know, the Omega binder training and, and pull out their binders, and they're pretty proud of that process that they went through, whether it's 40 years ago or 20 years ago. And obviously, from an implementation standpoint, uh, our our delivery uh, from an online perspective has changed, but the uh, the solid foundation of credit training has, and and, and the classroom component is very effective in there. So, I guess uh, as a quick follow-up question, we talked about the framework. Tell me a little bit about how the credit decision strategy can really effectively improve the overall loan process. Well, I mean, it's a really good question. As you know, um, each financial institution is somewhat unique in how they um, create their own internal loan processes. And I've really had the, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of banks over the years. And I'm kind of exposed to, in many cases, their loan and credit approval process. And guess what? It's not a big surprise if you view it side by side with this strat this credit decision strategy here, um, the similarities are, are and the overlaps are, are really abundant. I mean, for example, most banks are going to do a what Omega calls a preliminary assessment. Um, a bank might call it a deal screen meeting or a sniff test, if you will. Um, and and that's because we need to be efficient. If there's a strong red flag that the deal or the borrower is not going to fly within that particular bank's unique credit culture, or maybe it's just not market, then the analytics should stop and, the, and all parties should just not waste a lot of time and move on to another opportunity or another approach to the deal. I mean, I think one of the really big hidden costs in the relationship management business is is the time and the resources that the sales and the credit people sometimes spend on a deal that's just not going to fly. So it's really important to to understand that it does line up with our with most banks' um, lending strategies and the sequential nature of of this decision st strategy is important. And I know it's tough to do, um, and particularly if our borrowers are not necessarily educated or informed on the banking process. Uh, but it's just really important that we know that we shouldn't. Do just be rushing to pricing as the main aspect of, of you know, helping them decision our loans. So, Laura, I, I like the term that you mentioned, this being this decision strategy kind of being a blueprint, it's sustainable. So why don't we get into kind of the details, starting with the top down, and, and let's look first look at the opportunity assessment, and let's go ahead and, and, and talk about prospecting and identifying some of those opportunities. Any words of wisdom from your experience of gathering information in that first step in the decision strategy? You know, for the most part, I think bankers that I've come in contact with do a really good job here. Uh, they have the appropriate prospecting tools now and, you know, industry data information to really be able to prioritize the potential clients. And they do a pretty good job of staying in touch with the community and with their centers of influence so that they maintain a presence in the marketplace. Uh, I think that the biggest challenge that I see and uh, that, you know, the headwinds that face most bankers is consistency. Um, we all get busy and emerged in a deal, or a new deal that takes up all of our time or maybe two or three at once. And so it's difficult sometimes to maintain that prospecting behavior or those prospecting tasks. And sometimes we can ignore them for a while. But I gotta tell you, for the most part, I see the, the leadership of the banks that I'm involved with have very specific calling goals, um, which keeps this aspect of the job pretty robust. And um, I also believe that when a company, a bank has very strong, streamlined, well-communicated um, internal credit processes, then it does allow for that banker and that prospector, if you will, to be more consistent and able to achieve their, you know, their prospecting goals. So, Lori, you mentioned that for the most part, especially with you dealing with a number of our of, of clients from varying size institutions, that a lot of the bankers have the prospecting and, and also the identification of opportunities, especially with the data that's available to them with their internal systems and external processes, to do a fairly good job of that overall. So I guess let's move on to the next step and really get in as we get a little bit more deeper into 
the uh, the decision uh, strategy. And, and let's talk about that preliminary assessment and really how it's different from the opportunity assessment within the strategy. Sure. Uh, this is the step that um, I think uh, where we really want to take that opportunity to the next level. And this is where I see a lot of banks, the bankers struggle, uh, especially ones that, you know, maybe are less experienced. They're just going to take um, – in their preliminary assessment, everything looks great, and they're just going to take whatever is given to the client and sort of throw it up and see if it sticks uh, on the credit side. And I really spent a lot of time in my classrooms um, sort of slowing down and, and spending a lot of time on these beginning steps in the preliminary assessment because we don't want to just rush to market with a loan structure or pricing. We don't want to rush to the credit side um, without really thinking through what um, does a business do and what's changed, even with our existing clients, and why the company needs to borrow. Um, oftentimes the borrower just kind of says to us, well, uh, I just need a larger line of credit, and that's going to solve all my problems. And if we can just sort of slow down here and do some upfront analysis to address it, we're going to be a better trusted advisor to um, from the from the part of the banker, and I also think we'll be more competitive in the marketplace. And then when it comes to sort of borrowing causes, I mean, we all know that some borrowing causes or some loan purposes or purposes alone just inherently have more risk. And so we need to know that and sort of filter all of our analysis through that. So it's really an, a step that, you know, is often rushed through and it can lead to some – you know, misunderstanding of the transaction, maybe some misguided loan structures, and I, I think it's really important that that the client-facing sales associates need to be able to tell the story appropriately and in a succinct way. So it's all about sort of slowing down to speed up and to improve your approval rating overall. Sure, and I, I like that term of kind of slowing down to speed up and and ultimately managing expectations not only within the internal organization of the bank but also you know with your with your client on the client facing side and and one of the ways of doing that is is understanding the business as you mentioned but really more specifically getting into the operating cycle of the business can you can you explain and and opine a little bit about you know really how the the credit decision strategy fundamentally enhances the understanding of a business and, and, and the picture that you paint, uh, whether it's an internal, uh, you know, credit review or a, a process or externally to the, back to the, to, to your client base. Sure. Um, I, again, this is also part of the preliminary assessment, and I take a pretty big uh, deep dive here. And it's really demonstrated by what Omega calls the asset conversion cycle. And the asset conversion cycle is made up of two separate and unique cycles, one called the operating cycle, which you see here on the screen. Um, it also can be called the cash cycle. You'll hear that term a lot. And it really talks how the, the short term or the working assets of a business are converted. And the second one is what we call the capital investment cycle, which we'll get to in a moment. But let's first talk about the, the operating cycle. So as you can see here on the screen, it has so many applications for use. Um, first and foremost, um, it allows us to sort of break down the assets and the ways that a company employs its assets to ultimately make a sale and collect on and convert that sale to cash. And it can – by using it as a sort of a mental mind map for what I like to say to my uh, students is that it can be used both on the credit side and the sales side to really understand what a business does every day. Um, a business can go through many operating cycles. They can be simultaneous. And our, our financials really only show the average result of all of those business activities over a period of time. So by getting the folks to understand the operating cycle and relate it to the financials, it kind of brings the financial statements to life and gives us, you know, starts our, our way on understanding the meaning of the changes. So when you look at this operating cycle here on the um, on the screen, I mean, a super simple example would be, you know, a pizza carryout restaurant where you start at the top and you take the cash to buy the ingredients, you then... Uh, when the order comes in, you assemble the pizza, bake it, and that's really the all the holding period, box it, and then the customer picks it up, and that's when the sale occurs and the cycle's done. So it's super short, and there really isn't a need for a business like that to borrow um, because the cash cycle is super short. But 
many of our clients have longer cycle, uh, operating cycles and, and also multiple ones at the same time. So understanding these steps, these four steps here, is really important to um, give us some some pretty valuable insight into what the business does. And, and I also think it provides some lending opportunities a, as well. So would you uh, like for me to give you another example or – what do you think? Sure, I I, I think that, that you know these the, these the rather simplistic example that you said with the pizza shop, everyone can relate to that. But I've been in your classroom before, and I know how in depth and thorough you are. Maybe if you can give us a, a little bit more detailed example, like a manufacturer, or maybe a service company that you uh, you may have had some experience with, that can show a little bit more of the complexities that you know a typical typical borrowing cycle may uh, may incorporate. Sure. So I have one I can talk about, and, and this is um, a manufacturer, and this is one I use in the classroom. And this company manufactures nuts, bolts, screws, washers, uh, just really a fastener-type manufacturer. And, and as you can imagine, it's a much longer, more complex operating cycle. And what I do is I challenge my students to really think about the cycle. And so the diagram here starts with, well, we purchase the raw materials. But I actually say, okay, if it's a manufacturer that does a lot of custom work, and in my case, this manufacturer of fasteners does do customer work, even before they purchase raw materials, they have to do the design work. They have to design the prototype. And in that case, it uh, can be labor intensive, and design labor is pretty expensive, and that's cash out the door. So we, I break it down and really get them to think about that. And then kind of moving on to purchasing with my my fastener manufacturer, what are they going to purchase for raw materials? Um, obviously, it's steel, but probably different grades of steel, different types of other metal alloys. And then, you know, your more traditional questions like, where do you supply this? What are your relationships and discount terms? And it, or do you have any shortages or avail, you know, of that material? And the biggest one with my example is price volatility. How do you protect yourself with that? So you can see that just in the beginning with my example, there's so many questions that we can be asking and understanding and getting, and getting down to what the company really does. And then moving on to the production side, um, how long does it take? How well is your plant utilized? Do you have to pay a lot of overtime, or can you can you control your labor cost? Is it more variable? Um, how do you manage quality control, and what kinds of inefficiencies are there? So in addition to asking these questions to learn about the business, which is really important to our borrowers, um, they they want their banker to understand their business. It's also a great way to underco undercover some problems and risk um, and what they do as well. And then think about the shipping side, and this is right you know, simultaneously to the sale. With these fasteners, the nuts and bolts, very small objects, very very unique and complex and different ones for different companies, so you can imagine the inventory management needs that are done that are needed there. You know how is the shipment done? Is it expensive super heavy uh, uh, items, if you will? Um, are you only selling regional because of the shipping cost um, and and this can lead to the the big selling you know step can also lead to just who who are your buyers? Tell me about them. Um, how many custom fastening tools do you sell versus how much do you have in stock? Those are all questions that are really important. And and what are your what's your return history about those sales? And do you have concentration in particular user industries or obviously with the customer? And are your sales cyclical or seasonal in demand? And all of those things impact the cash flow of an operating cycle. So um, in this example that, that I use in the classroom, a lot, the buyers of the products are trailer, boat, and farm equipment manufacturers. They're huge. So this little manufacturing company that um, manufactures the bolts and the screws and whatnot, uh, they have payment terms and collection terms, but it's really a pain point for that company because they collect slowly. And so getting making sure that the banker really understands why, um, what the timing is of the collection and why the company needs to borrow and how much they need to borrow can really help us understand the unique liquidity needs of that particular borrower. So very, very applicable uh, 
example that you used there with, with the fastener company, in your estimation, any other uses of the operating cycle and the analysis that really drives it? Any other applicable uh, you know, deliveries for that? Well, I think, and I've alluded to it before, I think it's a great way to talk about risk so that when we get to doing some of our calculations, when we get to the financial statements, and we're doing that debt service coverage ratio calculation that we all do, we already have an idea of what maybe some of those risks are. Okay, so that, that fundamentally lays out kind of the operating cycle. We used a, a very uh, fundamental example, but also a little bit more complex that a lot of our our, our uh, clients can, can relate to. So let's move on to, to, to the next facet of the conversation. And as we move down the decision strategy here, the capital investment cycle. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and really uh, maybe try to incorporate the example that you just used? Sure. I mean, the capital investment cycle is the one we're most familiar with, and, and it's, and it's you know, the capital investments or equipment or expansion that um, our borrowers typically will come to us and ask for financing. So back to kind of my nuts and bolts manufacturer, you know, what equipment do they need? And that's where you would see the capital investment cycle in play. Do they need to purchase new equipment for every different type of customer or contract? And, you know, say for a boat manufacturer, nuts and bolts, as opposed to the farm equipment, because that can be really expensive. And actually, in this case, what the students learn is that the equipment stays the same. It's really the blades and the cutting tools that are attachments to the equipment um, that can be switched out for individual contracts. So it does help um, control the capital expenditures and, and the costs, and that clearly um, has an impact on cash flow. And these are typically financed as term loan opportunities, and, and we know that, and, and uh, again, we're all pretty adept at determining that debt service coverage ratio analysis, but one of the things to keep in mind, and if you look closely on the slide here, is that capital investment cycles are nothing more than a series of repetitive operating cycles. So again, back to understanding that. Okay, so you just introduced the, the TSCR, the debt service coverage ratio, and so that, that naturally allows us to kind of move further along here in the credit decision strategy. And, and let's focus a little bit now on the repayment source analysis and, and really the fundamentals of, of the, 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 the quantitative side that you're going to look at here. So I'll introduce it, and then I'll, I'll have you talk a little bit more about the, uh, you know, the repayment source analysis here that we're up against. Sure. So, I mean, this is where we spend most of our time, um, and, and, and this is obviously the most important, and um, debt repayment is, is huge. And I do think that oftentimes we, we you know, rush through, yet again, the, what I call the qualitative side before we get to the quantitative side. And I think it's really important that not only do we understand the industry, the industry trends, but understanding how our borrower operates within its competitive land. Landscape. And and that's important to to determine that. And it's important to understand the goals of uh, of of management. And are they appropriate? Are they going in the same direction as the industry? And you know, I've already talked about weak management and and how that can impact the financial results. I think the most important thing about the financial analysis section is the link. And what I call, what I like to use in the classroom are the three W's, or in the financial analysis, what happened? What are some of the big changes that we see in the financial ratios? And the second W is why. Why did it happen? And that's where that link comes in. If we don't understand the qualitative side and what's going on with the business and the industry, the business strategies in the industry, we can't answer the why. And, and that's so, so important. And lastly, Will it continue in the future? Um, doing the, the historical analysis is, is very important, but we have to use our judgment as to whether or not um, the, those, those ratios will continue because the debt service coverage is really only an indication of ability to pay. We have to pull everything together and make sure we understand the future. So um, that's, you know, we spend a lot of time here, and I think it's important that we don't get too lost in the ratios. Um, I, I would say that it's important that banks, especially bankers, follow the, the ratios that are encouraged within their own unique credit culture because there is some differences there. 
So to kind of use one of the terms that you, you had introduced before, referring to kind of credit is credit, and, and it hasn't fluctuated much over, over the duration of really the 40 years that Omega's been in business here. But moving on to the financial analysis section, any areas that you feel have changed during that cycle? Well, I think that you know we we tend to um, we we tend to kind of forget about cash flow, the true cash flow. We look at the debt service coverage ratio or the fixed charge coverage ratio, and we say, "Wow, that, oh good, the thing cash flows. Let's do the deal." And what I try to say to my students is, you know, well, I'll ask them what repays a loan, and they'll say. Uh, is it profits? And most of the time they say no. Profits aren't a cruel accounting concept, although in a very important one, it's cash flow. And then I surprise them by saying it's not earnings before interest taxes and depreciation and amortization. That's really only a proxy for cash flow. And they say, okay, it's cash flow as whatever, you know, they're with the proxy. And I say, nope, you're still wrong. And what I get to is it's future cash flow. So um, future cash flow is where the judgment comes in and where we have to pull all those thoughts together. And what I like to say to my students is that the debt service coverage ratio analysis or fixed charge coverage is really just the key that opens up the door to the approval, but it's not the approval. So that's a, that's a really good point. I guess that's, that's a nice segue kind of into our, our next area here, which is packaging. You know, loan packaging, and, and can you, you share with us, and you briefly introduced it before, about some of those pitfalls, especially with how sensitive the market is in general right now, of, of accelerating the process to get to packaging and really loan structuring and the negotiation piece. So any, uh, any experience and, and pitfalls that you've seen really in, in, in that skip of the, the, the fundamental steps in between and, and forcing the, the packaging. Sure. I mean, well, I mean, the, the loan structuring is really the art. I mean, it's the fun part. It's what we do. Um, as bankers, this is our product. We sell, um, we sell structure and loans to our banks and, I mean, to our borrowers. And there are just so many ways to structure a loan to the same borrower with the same purpose and, and, and with the same future cash flow. So I really encourage um, my students to look at the unique risk and strengths of a borrower. And when they go about structuring a loan in the classroom or in real life, I, I say, does your loan structure address and mitigate the risk? specifically, and does it also protect the strengths? So oftentimes they'll hear, well, their leverage is low. We don't need to address that in a covenant. And sometimes we do. Um, so, you know, I try to really try to crack the code in the art of loan structuring by getting folks to balance all of the elements, looking at the entire package, you know. Um, if they have a strong co collateral position, then maybe to be more competitive, we can offer a little bit less tight on a covenant, or the reverse can be true. Um, but I think it's really important that we identify how each risk can be mitigated by loan structure. Um, and I know we rush this step. The, the marketplace demands that we rush to loan structure sometime, but I really try to give advice to keep the big picture in mind and understand your credit policies and why those policies exist and make sure that if we are going to do an exception, pursue an exception to the policies, that we get it, we understand why. There's really not much more to say here because I, I really do think that most of our bankers spend about 90% of their time on this step, and I'm actually in the classroom kind of advocating for them to spend a little more time on the other parts of the decision strategy. So it's a good segue as we get a little bit farther along here in the decision strategy, and last but certainly not least, and you alluded to it, you know, earlier in the intro, is the final step in the process really here, which is, you know, the loan monitoring and, and fundamentally loan management and, and how often that does get overlooked. So any thoughts you have on that? Well, if any of us who have been in banking since the Great Recession, um, we've lived through a lot of regulatory reform, of aftermath and reform. And so now this has probably become the most important step and where we spend a ton of time. And there's been a lot of change here, and I would say there's been a lot of pain in our industry um, around this. But, you know, in looking back, we, you know, I think as an industry we can say that there's probably been some good processes that have emerged from it, so it's not all bad. But the most important thing, the key thing here is maintaining that proper 
relationship contact and conversations with a borrower so that we can foresee any changes in their performance, which would indicate an overall risk rating change. And the last thing a credit executive wants or the bank's financial, you know, finance area is a surprise. So, you know, we would want to avoid a, a, what what I call a double or a triple jump in risk rating, um, that clearly impacts you know, our loan reserves for the bank and it can impact our performance and credibility with the regulators and with the market analysts. So it's very important and key to the overall bank performance. So uh, keeping in contact with your borrowers um, is, is important and being objective and observant is also as well. And I really also think that maintaining and monitoring presents opportunities and allows us to deepen that relationship to become a, a trusted advisor. And, and I guess it's a, you know, as we get into, you know, we finish up the real granular aspect of the decision strategy, we take a kind of a step back here and, and really focus on, on how the credit decision strategy can effectively assist in the sales process and fundamentally, you know, deepen the relationship that our bankers have with, with their particular clients. Okay, sure. Um, well, I do think that we, you know, we've talked all about the decision strategy. We understand the importance of, you know, repayment source analysis and the qualitative and the quantitative side. But the activities that are involved um, around the operating cycle, I keep going back to that because it's my favorite thing, can really draw out other business needs and other, um, you know, opportunities for cost sell. And having those collaborative conversations specifically can, can really identify both treasury management, foreign exchange, other derivative type products that might actually be appropriate and ability, you know, able to sell. And I think that banks really need to, bankers really need to understand that true daily cash inflow and outflow for short term purposes. And, and that's what our treasury management folks are there to do. Um, and they're there to shorten that collection cycle or lengthen the payment cycle, even for a day or two. It enhances cash flow. Um, and by going through that operating cycle and really going deep into the purchase aspect of it, we can uncover all kinds of hedging products that m might be that, um, available. And going back to credit, um, it's a good idea to have the right size line of credit. The last thing we really want as bankers is to strain the liquidity of a company. So um, being able to point out some of those liquidity challenges a company might have um, and making them more efficient really just helps us become a, you know, gain credibility with our borrower ultimately. And, and credibility is, is so important. Uh, from many aspects, and I'm going to refer back to the, the webinar that we did, our first webinar in the series, talking about culture. It's exactly how Tom Early from Citizens Bank approached it, how important a strong credit culture in the organization is, you know, fundamentally to have very clear and concise expectations. Anything else that you want to add as we start to, to wind up the credit decision strategy overall? And uh, any other thoughts on, on, on really setting up a strong credit culture within the bank? Well, you know, I I got to tell you, Mike, um, I just talked about the sales process, and now we have a separate slide on the credit process. The two should be completely intertwined and linked together. And it's so important that our, our lending policies and processes and are ingrained into and part of the sales process and that they're communicated clearly and often to both the sales side and the credit side. It's just so important that they're adhered to. So this gives boundaries to everyone and it provides a consistent approach to how we market and how we do transactions. And ultimately by having a lot of clarity and who does what and when, it can enhance the sales process and, and, and improve, you know, maintain a good reputation to the bank's ability to deliver um, on what was maybe initially proposed. It increases, you know, the reputation of the bank out in the marketplace. And there's always tension between credit and sales. It's supposed to be. It's, that's the checks and balances that are needed. But the tension should be a healthy tension, and it should be about the deal at hand. The tension should not be about who does what, what's your role, what's my role, what are the processes. Those things should be down pat. And I think the key here is leadership and making sure that at the top of the house, 
both the credit managers and executives and the sales managers and executives are, are really in lockstep to their approaches and processes. And, and I don't mean it to be rigid in any way, um, but by working together, the bank can, can be flexible and earn the trust of our clients and, and be consistent um, with delivering our products, and particularly our credit products. You know, fundamentally, you're right back to your, to your last point about credibility. So uh, as we, we look at the time, time check here, we're, we're about 35 minutes past the hour. I, I do want to leave a little bit of time just for some question and answers here, but I also want to be very respectful of everyone's time since we do have such a large group on the phone today. Uh, if you just bear with me one moment, we have some questions coming in, and uh, I'm going to read a verbatim, and I'll try to get in as many as we can in maybe the next uh, few minutes here, if that's okay with you, Laura. Sure. Okay, so here's a question I have, and, and, and it's coming right through now. And basically looking for suggestions on how lenders can improve the skills around cash flow analysis. Any thoughts on that? So how can a lender uh, improve their skills around cash flow analysis? Well, a couple things. The first thing I would say is, you know, it's important to draw a conclusion and, and, and take a point of view on the cash flow. So if we're, we're looking at just a debt service coverage ratio, um, we want to also make sure we look at all those changes in the balance sheet to, to understand the cash inflows and outflow of a company and determine the liquidity and maybe some potential problems. And I think it's important that we use all those data points and draw a conclusion and take a point of view, point of view when we are, when we're analyzing that borrower and the transaction. Very well said, Laura. Right now, folks, uh, we're really coming up on time here. So I just, in, in slowly kind of recapping, uh, I want to thank everyone for their participation today. I want to thank you, Laura, uh, for not only your insight, but guiding us through the decision strategy. Uh, for everyone on, uh, that has dialed in, there will be a recording of this uh, available uh, very shortly. And as I mentioned, this was the second in our webinar series of the Credit Fundamentals. Our next one will be on May 12th at 1 o'clock Eastern time, very similar to this, and it's going to be a little bit more granular and really focusing on putting credit fundamentals into action. But I will say this, let's go ahead and also take a look at the latest blog post that Laura had posted about improving loan approval process by ultimately uh, implementing the credit decision strategy. Uh, as always, you can you can reach us uh, via our website, uh, and again, this recording will be available shortly. So, with that said, I appreciate everyone's time. Laura, thank you again for for your involvement, and I hope everybody has a uh, great rest of the afternoon. Take care. Thank you, Mike. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.